Hey everybody, before we get into today's episode, I want to take a minute to introduce our latest service called Crowd Insight by Gadgetflow. It's an awesome tool we made to help you get honest feedback for your upcoming crowdfunding project. Some of the big results we've seen include increased conversion rate, finding out why your project isn't performing well, and getting feedback you need from potential backers. So please head over to gadgetflow.com slash crowd insight to check it out today. You can also find a link in this week's show notes. Now let's get into the episode. Hello world, this is the Gadget Flow Podcast, the show about everything related to products, entrepreneurship, marketing, and crowdfunding. This week, I got to chat with Kirsten Ross from Crowdfunding Uncut. And Kirsten is an expert, a consultant, and an excellent podcaster on the subject of crowdfunding and has helped countless people create successful campaigns. This is a great, great interview and episode, so I'm not going to waste any more time. Here is my chat with Kirsten Ross. I am here with Kirsten Ross of Crowdfunding and Cut. Kirsten, how are you doing? Really good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really, really stoked to have you on the Gadget Flow podcast this week. And for our listeners who may not know who you are, or what it is you do, can you just give a brief snapshot into your world? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm Kirsten. Uh, I've been in the crowdfunding space, uh, online marketing for about four years now. Um, I won't go into my backstory just yet, but I help um, product creators bring their ideas to market, and we use that through Kickstarter. Um, we're slightly different from other marketing things because we come in and do pre-launch. So we help with, um, essentially, when you have a prototype, how to have uh, momentum when you launch your crowdfunding campaign as well. So um, consider me a product launch master, so to speak, with the... Uh, the before stuff that, that really needs to be done as well. So, and I'm Canadian, so you might pick up some A's or whatever. Um, I love making fun of myself. So yeah, I'm just, I'm in Toronto. That is awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, I have a million questions regarding crowdfunding and all your expertise in that realm. But first I want to know how you got into crowdfunding. I want to know your story. I want to know what brought you uh, to the crowdfunding world. What door opened up for you? I just want to hear, you know, your backstory and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, um, I really fell into crowdfunding. Um, to date, I've raised over 2.5 mil um, on Kickstarter and Indiegogo mainly, but I've been a startup advisor for about eight years now. Um the short version is in university, I was taking um, like biopharmaceutical science. And in my second year, I was recruited by a organization to learn how to run a business. And so the picture of franchise model, um, the model was a student house painting business. So at 18 years old, I was knocking on doors in Ottawa, Canada, trying to sell house painting. So if you had a bedroom that needed painting or windows or a porch or whatever, that was the service I was selling. And then when I uh, got a contract, I would then hire painters and facilitate that whole production process. So that's how I got into um, running a company. Um, At 18 years old, I was a glorified contractor. And I did that for three years. And I was one of their top um, top franchises in terms of revenue in Canada. And so when I graduated, the company asked me to come on board as a startup advisor, which would be someone who would uh, recruit students that wanted to learn how to f- run a company and teach them in six months how to go from zero to like 80, 100,000 plus in revenue. Um, and so I learned a model for consulting that would take someone from literally nothing to being a profitable entrepreneur um, in, in six or seven months. And um, I loved it. Like, I love the, the transformation when someone has a model they can replicate and execute going from, I know nothing about running a company to running those kind of numbers at such a young age. Like, I loved it. And um, I ended up... Uh, working in that capacity for four years, um, I launched like over a hundred different entrepreneur franchises with the company. And I knew like I wanted to be a consultant. I wanted to work with people early stage. 
But it took me about three years uh, from leaving that company to actually find crowdfunding. So after seven years of that company, I was like 24, 25. Um, I went and did the typical, let's go find myself. So I went traveling. Um, I ended up living in the UK for a couple years. I backpacked Australia and just trying to like find my feet. And it wasn't until about three to four years ago that um, I discovered consulting was my thing. And um, I think it was just something I had to wrap my brain around. Like it was one thing to teach a very specific model, which was house painting. But I was living in the UK at the time. I started going to all these entrepreneur events and I found myself speaking to freelancers and um, just like they all had issues. Like, I don't know how to find my customer. I don't know how to be profitable, whatever it was that I, I used to help people with. And I found myself like just giving them advice and they were getting results. And that's the aha moment for me when I was like, oh my God, I could work with people and get paid as a consultant in different niches. Okay. And I started learning the online space and it wasn't until three years ago when I, I walked into a networking event in Toronto and I met the founder of my first Indiegogo campaign. And at the time he's like, do you know what this crowdfunding thing is? I'm like, nope, but your product sounds cool. So let's like, just try a campaign. And of course it was like fast forward three months. It was an absolute disaster. <laughs> like they all are right. Um, so that first campaign, we ended up um, failing. We raised a third of what we needed to. And we, um, after like figuring out why it failed, we decided to relaunch it. And so a few months later, we relaunched that same product and ended up raising over 600000 for it, which, of course, that turnaround for us started getting uh, me speaking gigs around Toronto. And I started to land a couple more clients. And it just kind of snowballed from there to today. Yeah. So before we move on, I have to ask, what did you do? I mean, just, you know, you can give me a, a quick snapshot, but what did you do between the campaign? I mean, that's a huge, huge jump and a huge success for that campaign after it had failed the one time. What did you do? Um, two things. But the main thing was we it did not game ourselves for having momentum on the first day. So like you hear on all these podcasts, you need to have an audience going into it. Well, we didn't have an audience going into it. And not only that, but we didn't understand our customers. So we, even the, the friends and family we sent to our crowdfunding page, they didn't really resonate with the offer because we hadn't taken the time to get to know our customers. So it was a mix of making sure we get a ton of traffic on that first day, but also once the traffic got to the page, being able to position the product properly. So those are the two things that we, we changed with that. Yeah. Yes, I can totally understand why you would be slammed now, why you'd be so busy. So fast forward to today, do you have people working with you, for you? Do you have a team around you that helps you out um, with all these really, really big projects? Is it just you? How, how are you doing all that you do? Yeah, so I, I've intentionally not built a large agency around this. Um, I like to work with a select few clients. So we have about three to four on the go at any any given time because I don't want to outsource the work I do. I like to have a high touch point with the clients we have on. However, in saying that, when you go to orchestrate a crowdfunding campaign, there are certain skills and, that you need. Like you need Facebook ads, you need a good videographer, you need a good graphic designer. So I do have, um, I've set it up so that um, I do have specialized contractors that I work with so that people can come to us for a done for you service, but we're just pretty selective with who we work with. So I have about four people, um, that work with me on campaigns. So that gives me an opportunity to focus on the strategy myself while outsourcing the experts type work that, uh, frankly, I'm not the best at Facebook ads, so I don't want to be hired for Facebook ads, but we have someone on staff that's really good at doing that for launches. Got it. So I know this is diverting from the subject of crowdfunding specifically, and I hope you don't mind, but I am curious, if you have a team of people you're working with, what, what are some challenges that you faced in working with a team and having people work for you? And maybe what are some ways that you've found to overcome those challenges to make your, your product even better than had it just been just you or whatever it was before that? Like, Can you just explain that to me? 
Hmm. I think with having a team of people is going to be communicating the vision. So every, um, every client we get on is different and their goals are slightly different. And I need to make sure that, um, deadlines are communicated properly and the outcome is communicated properly. Just so you don't have things like, um, let's just say the client wants to, I don't know, have a conservative approach to Facebook ads, or they want their um, brand to be goofy. If I don't communicate that little thing, then my Facebook ad girl may not create the ads in alignment with that. And then like the branding across the board, because we have different people, like the video is not going to feel in alignment with the Facebook ads. Um, The photos won't be in alignment with that. So we, I think really, uh, if I can distill that, it's truly understanding what, how the client wants their brand represented online and make sure that we communicate that with all the freelancers so that we're on board with that project. Cause it's not a cookie cutter solution. We do custom, um, like, you know, we do custom stuff. So like, I find that we are reinventing stuff a lot of the time and that can be hard to communicate. A second thing is expectations management. I find that crowdfunding is very wild west and you have to be careful not to promise the world. Like I have had leads come to me and say, we're going to be the next million dollar campaign. And like, I don't want to kill your dream, but the odds of that happening are slim. And we're more for I like to be very realistic with what the client's getting into and make them understand that um, they have to be able to pivot. So I think managing client expectations just from my end is difficult because they, if they have a new product and customer feedback comes back that they um, basically are saying that someone doesn't want to pay the price that the founder wants to charge, or if the founder is a hundred percent sold that it's going to be the athletic community that, or like males between 50 and 70 that are going to buy their product. But the data comes back as something completely opposite. They have to be willing to pivot. And it's like, I I think just clients for a first time entrepreneur venture or a product launch, it's such a crapshoot that they, they need to be open. And I have to set good expectations with what the process looks like so that they don't come back to me later and say like, this isn't what I wanted or, whatever. Right. Right. So what would you say is the biggest challenge, um, or maybe the biggest, uh, issue you're seeing in people with failing crowdfunding campaigns? What's the thing that you think people should really focus in on and make sure that they get right before launching their campaign? I would say getting their audience, right. Um, cause what you're going to see, uh, I'll give you an example. One of our clients, um, they didn't launch their brand on crowdfunding, But their first product, they made the assumption, like every founder does, that their demographic or their customer is a specific person. So they started advertising to their assumed customer. So they assumed their customer would be males between uh, 24 and 45. And they didn't, when it it came time to actually looking into the data after they'd become a seven-figure brand, uh, it turns out that the people that actually resonated the most with their brand and, and made purchases of this product were females between 45 and 65. So you yeah, pretty different. So you can imagine how much money was left on the table by advertising to the wrong demographic. And so that's the, that's a thing too, is when you launch a crowdfunding campaign, all like founders, we all need to start with an assumption, but if you don't test the assumption and pivot to actually cater to, um, who your real customer is that, um, basically, you know, test who your customer demographic is and really understand your customer, you're not going to have a strong or compelling marketing message and you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So I think that's the hardest part is when you start with Facebook ads or you start um, just trying to sell a product online, you, you need to give yourselves two to six months to really figure out who that ideal customer is. Because if you advertise to the wrong age group or it's males versus females, or you don't understand, um, the main motivation for why someone's going to buy your product, it's, you know, your, your advertising efforts will fall short. So I think that's the one area that people don't, um, spend a lot of time on because they, they just assume that, well, it's obvious that my customer should be this person when in fact, uh, your assumptions are probably wrong. 
all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Totally. Totally. So break it down for me just really practically. What does that look like? If someone's trying to test their audience, if someone's trying to test the market to find that right customer for their product, you know, I I mean, is that something you guys do as a company? Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, cool. So, and maybe if someone's trying to do it on their, on their own, maybe just break it down. What does that look like practically to find your target audience? Yeah, um, we do have a process that we've created. Um, So there's two ways we do it. Uh, The first one is if you want to hire us to do it, um, anytime we bring on a new client, we put them through an eight-week market testing period where we set up a landing page, we drive ads to that landing page to see how much it's going to cost for us to get an email address. So that's how we test interest. Um, through cold, a cold audience online. So that's one way you could just outsource this. And at the end of the eight weeks, you could say, okay, well, we've tested all these audiences, this copy, these images, and we're getting emails at like 18 to $25. So the offer isn't quite ready. But then there are other clients that after uh, two to six week testing period, we, after a bit of optimization, we see that we can get emails for $2 or less. At that point, that's a good gauge of interest that, okay, this is a product that we think will be successful. So that's one way to test. Um, the second way is if you just want to do this yourself, um, by you doing Facebook ads and testing different audiences, different copy, uh, different price points, et cetera, et cetera. If you can get an email address for less than $3 to start, then that's going to be a good gauge of interest. Um, otherwise what you can do is I've, um, I have a friend who runs a brewery here in Toronto and they're releasing a new cider that's completely sugar-free, no artificial sweetener, blah, blah, blah. And he sends me a survey because he wants, um, his audience to tell him what design to use for this new can. So he was testing branding at this point. And so he sends me a survey with different visuals of, uh, which kind of visual do I like better for the can? That's something you could do through customer surveys or, you can use surveys to ask people, like just say your product has five different features. So I'll take the Jamstack, for example. It's one of our products that um, is a amplifier uh, for electric guitar users. So it's a small amp that clips onto the base of your guitar that means that you can now play um, anywhere because amps are typically really expensive and really bulky, but this is a like in-hand pocket solution that you can use. So if we list out the features, one of them can be it's completely portable. One can be um, there's a volume knob on it. One can be you can attach your smartphone to it to do cool like uh, music things, effects. Exactly. I was like, what's the word? Um, But the thing is that we don't want to like shove this information down someone's throat by listing off all these amazing features on a crowdfunding page. So we need to figure out what is the one that resonates the most with people. So through our email list and friends and family, we can send a survey around that says how important are each of these features to you. And from that, we can figure out what the most important feature is. So we know where to focus our advertising, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like things like that. Right. Totally. Yeah. I think if your audience tells you what they want and then they end up buying, like there's no better way to, to find out what uh, your target market wants than them telling you and then buying. So that makes a lot of sense. So my next question is what, what differentiates you guys now? Like, so there are people who are trying to do what you guys do. What makes you guys different? What makes you stand out from the competition from helping people with their crowdfunding campaigns? Yeah, we treat, I think there are two kinds of, um, crowdfunding campaign services. There are the ones that you hire before you launch and then the ones you hire after you launch. Um, the ones you hire after you launch are going to be ones that are designed to take your uh, like little success you've had so far and gives you more backers throughout the campaign. So it's like more of an amplification model. Whereas with us and what we do is a model that we use for clients um, with any product launch. So it's not necessarily for Kickstarter, but we are different because we focus on the pre-launch. So someone's like, all right, I have a product. I need to build an audience around this and awareness. Um, so we do the Facebook ads, we do the, the marketing and stuff like that for it. But, um, I'm super paranoid of failure because Kickstarter is a very public thing. So I, um, we've created a, 
a system so that when someone, um, before someone launches a campaign, we're testing a lot of the criteria like we talked about in that last question. So we don't just build a, uh, an email list. Like we're constantly testing that list. We're doing things to really get to understand our customer so that we, if we look at where the failure pains of a failure points of a project are, we can gamify that by doing some research ahead of time as we're growing the audience. So that's what makes us a bit different is that we do the pre-launch, but we also make sure that um, we're testing for failure points along the way. Got it. Okay. So I'm thinking of someone, and uh, this is my last question for you today, but I'm thinking of someone who's just starting out, who has a product they're excited to, to launch into the world of the crowdfunding campaign realm. What is one piece of advice, the one thing you would tell them to focus in on before launching their campaign? What is the non-negotiable thing you think that they need to focus on? Yeah. Um, while from a marketing standpoint, it's having an audience, but at the very base of any idea that you have, um, before you start spending money on prototyping and manufacturing, whatever, you got to make sure that you have something that is going to sell. So a lot of the, it's getting that early feedback. If you are creating a journal, um, that's super different because you created this, uh, amazing framework that's helped you get through your exams, whatever it is. Right. Um, you, again, you assume it's a great idea because it worked for you, but don't launch a campaign off that. You actually want to um, look around your peer network and see if you can get any beta testers or anyone in your network to use the journal, get feedback, iterate the product, and create a final product that um, people actually want to buy, I think is, is step one. And, I, and that's completely underused because, again, um, until you have a product flop and you've wasted $10,000, typically people don't think to validate the idea. I mean, as applying this in the internet marketing space, for example, I have a lot of friends and that's how I learned how not to do this. But I have a lot of friends who spent like six months creating this amazing digital course or writing this book, and then they try and sell it and they can't sell it and they don't understand why. So there's this hack you'll use in internet marketing, which is ask people if they want this thing. And if they do get them to buy it, and then you create it. So it's like kind of like Kickstarter where um, I a few years ago created a membership site for crowdfunding and it, it's not active anymore, but I didn't even know if people on my email list wanted a membership site with crowdfunding courses and whatever. So I sent an email to my list. I'm like, hey guys, based on a lot of questions I've been getting, I had this idea. If you like this idea and you would buy it for $29 a month or whatever, like just hit reply and say, heck yes. And I had like about 60 people come back and be like, yeah, I really want that. And that for me was enough validation to say, okay, well, I'm going to do a launch. I'm going to pre-sell a bunch of this stuff. And then I'm just going to create a bunch of content. Um, because you know at that point that it's something people want. Awesome. Well, Kirsten, I think you've really been helpful this interview. I've learned a lot. Um, I think you've given a lot of fresh insight into the world of crowdfunding. Maybe now you can let everyone know where they can find you online, where they can keep updated and what, what you guys are up to. Yeah, I think the best place is crowdfundinguncut.com. Um, there it's mostly a podcast. So there's a, about 120 different episodes I've done. And if you have, if you can't find an episode you're looking for, or you have a very specific question about your project, you can email me. Uh, it's K. So the letter K at crowdfunding uncut.com. That's probably the best place. And just mention like gadget flow in the subject line. So I know where you're coming from. Yes, that sounds great. And everyone, make sure to go uh, check out the show notes after the, you listen. I will have all the links for Kirsten's podcast and the website and all that good stuff. So, Kirsten, thank you so much for being on the Gadget Flow podcast. No worries. Thanks for having me. That was my interview with Kirsten Ross. Please make sure to check out everything she is doing with Crowdfunding Uncut and check out her podcast to learn even more about the subject of crowdfunding. Thanks for being on, Kirsten. This podcast is made by Gadgetflow, and we're proud to be the number one platform to find new and awesome gadgets. 
so make sure to check out our site all the time for new products we're curating every single day. We'll be back next week with another new episode, so in the meantime, please go rate and review our show on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening to the Gadget Flow Podcast. <laughs>